Hello, Undisputed listeners. This is Skip Bayless. Weekdays on Undisputed, I debate my co-host Shannon Sharp on the biggest sports news of the day. But now it is time for me to unleash in a brand new way. Introducing the Skip Bayless Show. My opportunity to share behind the scenes stories about things I've seen and confrontations I've had from decades covering the NFL and NBA. This is an opportunity to go so much deeper into solo opinions that just don't fit in rapid fire debate. I will respond to your no holes barred question. You can ask me anything about why I've said what I've said or about what goes on off camera on Undisputed. Your question should be as provocative as you want. My answer sure will be. New episodes of The Skip Bayless Show will come out each week. Make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Welcome to the Undisputed Podcast. I'm your host, Jenny Taft. This podcast is the full show from today's episode of Undisputed from start to finish. They've got a busy slate, so skip Shannon. Let's get to it. Good morning. Welcome to Undisputed. I'm Jenny Taft alongside Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp. Guys, how are you doing? I'm not doing good. I'm not doing good at all. Shannon Sharp. Well, wait a second. I, I believe you're back in your home state of Georgia, and I'm a little surprised that customs actually let you back in the state after you kept picking against those bulldogs game after game after game. Am I right? I, I did, Skip, but it was the airports weren't busy yesterday. I snuck in like a thief in the night, oh. and so no one really knows I'm here until you just ghosted me and dry snitch and let everybody know that I was in Georgia. I thought we talked about this yesterday. Hey, I'm the wettest dry snitcher there ever was. <laughs> exactly. Congratulations. <laughs> like a thief in the night. I have a feeling, yeah. Jenny, you're going to hear from a few people while you're home. Uh, yes. But I know why you're not feeling so good today, and it has something to do with your Lakers. Again, mm. Shannon, what's going on? Let's talk about what we saw <laughs> last night, guys. Russell Westbrook may have hit a new low last night, scoring only eight points on two of 14 shooting and the Lakers 125 at 116 loss to the Kings. LeBron actually scored a game high 34 points and LA did have a 14 point lead earlier in the game, but the defense slipped and frustration took over as the purple and gold fell back to 500 on the season. You know, Shannon, a lot of people before, before the season started, they picked the Lakers to win the West. What has happened to this team? They're not a good basketball team. They can do all the talking and they can go have all the meetings they want and they can say, well, this, this team did this in a different sport. We're very capable of doing that. If you look at the talent that we have, we, you look at the what we've been able to accomplish individually and some of us have accomplished some great things together. They're not a good basketball team. Skip, that small lineup, and I said it, Skip, we've talked about it. It is very conducive for spreading the floor, letting guys get lanes, and can be able to shoot the, uh, shoot the basketball. LeBron has benefited the most from this small lineup, but you are at a disadvantage when it comes to defense. First of all, they don't play defense to begin with. So now when you, you, you think, put this in context, Skip, you don't play defense and you got smaller guys on the floor. The Kings got 70 points in the paint without a big. Okay, Marvin Bagley Jr. is really a big, and they've been trying to get rid of him for the last three years. And Tyrese True. Halliburton said after the game, said we knew we could get whatever we wanted. What, whatever we just we had to put the we just had to put the ball in the basket. And Skip, they got a 14-point lead. And it seems like every time they get a lead, everybody now all of a sudden, LeBron started it off, jacking up ill advised threes. And then if, if LeBron does it, who else you think is gonna do it? Russ like, well, there's no AD. I'm second in command. I can start jacking up bad shots. And you jack up bad shots, you don't play defense. A 14-point lead all of a sudden becomes an 11, 12-point uh, 11, deficit. Skip, I can sum this game up for you last night. Austin Reeves got hot in the third quarter. He hits back-to-back threes. Instead of Russ coming down and trying to say, okay, go pick for him so I can get him another three, what does Russ do? He takes a three, holds the pose. His guy that's guarding leaks out, gets a layup. He said, you know what? I got something better for you. I'm going to come back down the court. 
I'm going to jump up in the air. I got nowhere to go with the basketball. Turns it over. It leads to a transition three by Buddy Hill. So what was a, a, a six-point game, now all of a sudden the 11-point game going into the fourth. Skip, they get it down. You know what? They whittle it down. They got it down to four. LeBron passed the ball to Russ and just stands there. He said, watch this, y'all. He said, I want everybody at home. Everybody, watch this. He passed it to Russ. Get what did Russ do? Break the three. They come down, get a shot, and the ball game is, for all intents and purposes, is over. It was over. Skip, I wish I could say, you know what? When AD gets back, everything's going to be well. But AD wasn't playing well before he left. So when he comes back, everything isn't going to be well. Skip, I wish I can give you, say, well, you know, this, that, and that. They're not good. I can't sum it up for you in any simpler or terms. They're not a good basketball team. They don't play defense. They came out scorching hot. Malik Monk was hitting threes. LeBron hit a couple. LeBron was getting downhill. They were playing well. But it seems to me when they start hitting threes, not everybody just wants to come up and jack up threes and nobody plays defense. Skip, I'm looking at the, the shooting chart for the, uh, uh, the Sacramento Kings. Nobody shot oh, under no 50%. Mm-mm. Skip, are you 7 of 14, 9 of 14, mm-hmm. 7 of 12, 5 of mm-hmm. 8, 5 of 10, mm-hmm. 11 of 21, 4 of 8, 3 of 4? Skip! 55%. How you gonna be? Yeah! 55%. I mean, I've been in practice and we couldn't shoot 55%. They shooting this in an NBA game against other elite level talent. That, this is embarrassing. This is embarrassing. It doesn't get any work lower than this. And I'm looking at Russ. Skip his last three games. Now, this is three straight games in which he scored single-digit points. He's 8 yep. of 40. Skip, 20%. Russ is shooting 20% from the field. 20. Field. I, I, I tweeted last night, Skip, is there a quota on how many layups you can miss in a game or you can miss in a season? Yeah. Because I can assure you Russell Westbrook is over that limit. He's reached the mm-hmm. number of misses in a, a game that – a, a NBA player shouldn't miss in the season. And it's bad. It's embarrassing. But, Skip, they're not good. They're not going anywhere. I don't care how many more meetings they have. I don't care what. They could have Dr. Phil. They could have uh, a Tony Robbins come in and speak. Hell, if you want to, bring Steve Harvey. He's good at pep talk. Ain't nothing happening. He is. Ain't nothing happening. This is who they are. This is what they are. Are you ready to say, right here, right now, that your Lakers will miss the playoffs. Skip, Are you ready to Skip, go there? I hope, Skip, I told you that. I said, Skip, you talking about play-in. I said, I'm hoping they can just make the turn. They can just make the play-in. Oh, as we speak right now, they're not making it. They're not making the playoffs. Playoffs? I'm like Jim Morrissey. Playoffs? I just hope they can win another game. Okay. I wanted to get you back on record because – just to keep everybody with the biggest picture here, as Jenny read to start this topic off, the Lakers, which I had forgotten actually, were prohibitive favorites to win the West. Correct. They were, let's call it consensus, maybe not prohibitive, but consensus yes. favorites yeah. by all the betting sites to win mm-hmm. the Western Conference. They have plummeted to 21 and 21. We are more than halfway through this basketball season. Yes. And obviously, you did make one point that we have to get back on the record. They are now without Anthony Davis. I still consider him a top 10 player. But to your point, he has not played like a top 10 or 20 or 30 or maybe 40 player so far this year. And I don't know why. Correct. Low motor, low energy, low urgency, comes and goes, disappears. I, I don't know. And now he has disappeared for good because he's got a knee issue. And I think they're going to announce tomorrow just an update on when he might return. OK, so before I launch on this, I would like to congratulate you first, because at the end of the show yesterday, <laughs> I, I proposed a bet to you because your Lakers were four point favorites at Sacramento. Yeah. And I said, I'll take the four and Sacramento. And you said no. And then we tried to wrangle it and, and haggle it and back and forth. But, <laughs> but you steadfastly dug in and said, no, 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 because 
you have finally seen the light, which is yeah. the dark, actually, which is th <laughs> there is no light at the end of this tunnel. No. The Sacramento Kings, the Kings have owned the King this year, which is preposterous to me. It's mind blowing to me. It's it's inexplicably pathetically awful when we think about the Los Angeles Lakers. Now, once upon a time, they had battles with the Kings when they had Chris Webber and Stojakovic and all that. You know, remember the, the glory days of the Kings and Vladi. But right, baby. these are not those Kings. Yeah, no. these Kings had lost five straight. They had lost six of their last seven. And I'm sure most people expected LeBron and company to flex as they did early in the game and take this game over and win it by six, eight, 10, 12 points. And it looked like <clears throat> that was happening in the middle of the second quarter because LeBron actually hit a three with 219 left in the second quarter that put them up 14 points. Well, yeah. how many times have we seen that this year? Big right. leads go poof. Okay, here we go again. I'm, I'm about to get to Russell West Brick, but first, I, I can't let LeBron go blameless for last night. No, absolutely not. He's still, look, look, he's still obviously a top five player. You, yes. you can make the case he's a top three player. You can also make the case he's been on an MVP kind of tear over his last, what, 15 games? Yes. 20 games? Yes, since and he's been once back. once again, yeah, he, he wound up with 34 more points last night. Pretty special, given that he just turned 37 in his 19th year. But what's not special is... It took him 29 shots to get to 34 points. Mm -hmm. Th that won't work. No. And he, he's jacking up threes at by far the highest rate of his career because if, if we look back to the last two years, he took career high 6.3 threes a game. The last two right. years, those are career highs. He's all the way up at 7.9. So he's taken eight threes a game. And last night he was feeling it. And as we always talk about, if you, LeBron, be careful. Don't fall completely back in love with that shot <laughs> because your, your, your career says you're average at best from three. And right now right. he's right in the middle of pack of three-point shooters. He's at 36.6%. It's right dead middle of all the three-point shooters in the league. Yep. Yet, wait a second. He's 16th in the league in attempts from three. Man, that's a lot. Last night it was way too many because he took 12. And he made only three. But to your right. point, early on, it looked like he was just dominating. It looked like he was, I, I don't know, in, in his glory days, in his younger days, if we took him back 10 years ago, the start he had last night in Sacramento would have oh, equaled a 50-point game. Absolute, 50, no question. seriously. No question. No I, question. I, I, uh, Shannon, seriously, mid-second quarter, I'm thinking he might go for 50. The problem mm -hmm. is... He, he's in his 19th year. He's yeah, going he to start to run out of some gas. Right, so right. here's the bottom line takeaway. As great as he is at 37, and I will give you this, he's having as great a 37-year-old 19th year as we've ever seen. Well, who, who could argue that? Right. But he's still, at this point, he's not capable of carrying what is a mediocre supporting cast. No to victory even at Sacramento. He can't sustain. It, it, right. it takes four quarters of that. It takes 50 points for him to get them home. And, right. and he can't go cold from three. And he went cold. Right. And then the, the old nemesis bit him in the butt last night. He started missing free throws. He got that great new bang, bang free throw routine that, that's been stunning to me. But it, it fell off rhythm last night a little bit, and he was 5 of 10. Well, after well, a while, you can't, as a team, you can't miss eight free throws, right? Well, Skip, I, you, I could tell last night because he missed his first three. He missed the first, he, he got fouled, he missed the first two, came back, missed another one, made the second one, so I knew it was going to be an off night. He's more, he, he's definitely a rhythm free throw shooter, Skip. When he makes yep. them early, he normally carries that yep. throughout the game, and you're absolutely right, yep. Skip. He cannot go blameless in this situation because I thought in the third quarter, he jacked up too many threes. And, I, and you're also right in this point, Skip, is that when he gets hot like that, if you notice, Skip, like if he gets hot in the first quarter, He'll let yep. somebody else so he can try and rest 
recuperate in the second quarter. That's where when you have a Russ, he does. that's when Russell was supposed to come in and do damage. Okay, if he I gets it hot for the first half, now he's like, I'm going to chill to the third, let the third quarter chill. Okay, you guys do it. Well, when he was, like you said, when he was 27, 28, he could carry that. He's getting up he to would. the stars that he's getting off skip. He's having 19, 17, 20, 23 points in a half. LeBron James would count 48, 50, 52 points at the end of the game. It's just unsustainable for him to, it's like anything, Skip, it's like a, a, a runner. You might be able to run, you know, three, four, five-minute miles, I mean, a, a four-minute, five-minute, four-minute miles for like three or four miles. But as you start to age, Skip, that time start going to 420, 430, and all of a sudden it's five-minute miles. Well, LeBron James, he just can't play at that elite level. For 38, 40, 42 minutes like he no. once could. And by the way, last night the Nets made a statement at Chicago and oh, Kevin Durant, they? the best player on the planet, yep. Kevin Durant last night scored 27 on 10 shots. LeBron <laughs> scored 34 on 29 shots, just to give you some comparison. Well, it I, just I takes too game. many shots. I watched okay. that game, Skip. I've never it. seen anything like that. 71 71, and the next day you know it's 131 to 81. Boom. Well, uh, it's the Kyrie effect. Uh, all of a sudden, Kevin's got Kyrie back at riding shotgun, and he's like, watch this. Okay. Now we turn to the man I nicknamed long ago Russell West Brick. The irony of last night was only one turnover for Russell West Brick, and yet he still leads the league by far in turnovers because what is he? He's still plus 19 on James Harden. But the, the painful irony for you is that Russell Westbrook also leads the league in minutes played by a ton. He's played 52 more minutes than anybody in the league, which is not good news. It's bad news for you and the Lakers <laughs> because he is as pathetic a shooter as a point guard as we have ever seen in the history of this league. He has the worst hands and the worst shot of any point guard at, at a high level we've ever seen in this league. No so question. last night, he, he goes 2 for 14 from the floor, and here we go again, 0 for 5 from 3. He has now plummeted to 28.8% from 3. That ranks 150th of 154 qualified three-point shooters. It's hard to overcome that because... They're going to dare him to shoot, and, yeah. and he has such sort of, he's so defiantly delusional about how great he is that he's going to say, you dare me? Watch this. I'll take it. So right. if we could, we usually do our daily turnover blooper reel. Could we just do the West Brickian missed shot <laughs> reel, if we could, from last night? Could we see all 12, please, of the missed shots? It's a clown act. I agree. Ross, it, to your point, come on. How, how can you, can't you, can't, you're left-handed naturally. You're born left-handed. What was that shot? Ross, d just don't even try those. It's, they're going to, you're going to West Brick all those. Dare you, dare you. Now he has to pull up from mid-range and it's way short. Ross, just think about it. Just think about it. You don't have to do this. What, Ross, that didn't even come close. There's no touch. Love. Ooh. Come on. Russ? Well, you didn't think that was going to get blocked? By... Okay. What? what? Shannon, he can't finish. Terrible no. hands. Well, that's what happens when you become Ooh, less athletic, bad. Skip. Bad. You can't get high yeah, enough to finish above the rim. Yeah. Everything is short or too yep. hard. This is the last one, and that's just that's the one you talked about. No, I'm sorry. There's one more. I thought that was the one they dared him. All these are dare shots. And they're not even close. We're not talking about lipping. We're not talking about a lot of in and outs, barelys. Nope, he just misses. Here we go again. Y do you really nope. think that's going to go? No, I don't. I didn't. Skip, he plays He okay. plays what they call hope basketball. He throws it up. I hope it goes in. Skip, a lot of those shots have zero chance, zero to a very small chance of going in. And there's a reason there's a reason why he always skipped. You notice, like when they swing the ball, who's always wide open for a three? Russ! 
because the help is always coming off of him because they're hoping it. They're hoping, they're praying. Make them swing the ball to him and then cut him off at, just don't give him a driver layup. Make him, make him contest his layups because now the athleticism is waning and he's not able to over, elevate over everyone and lay the ball into the basket. So now a lot of times it's hitting the bottom of the rim or it's going way over the top because the athleticism is starting to wane and he's not fundamentally sound. Skip, you see the difference? LeBron James is technically sound, so he still can get spots and get his shot. So at, he's going to suffer less from his athleticism waning as opposed to a guy yeah. like Russell Westbrook who's reliant, who's been so heavily reliant on his, on his athleticism. Kevin Durant, who's going to age gracefully because he's not reliant on athleticism. Guys that are no. athletic, look at Derrick Rose. Look at guys that's been very athletic, Skip, and relied so much on that. They suffer injury, they start to age, and it's hard on them. I agree. And yet, I told you before the year started, my biggest fear for LeBron was he's an average three-point shooter. Russ is a pathetic three-point shooter and also yes. a pathetic free-throw shooter. We didn't even get to that. But what's going to start happening, I predicted, is that Russ's man will just fall back into the lane yeah. and say, you can't come in here. I, I'm going to... I'm going to cut off your route. I'm, I'm going to close the freeway on you to the basket because if you want to make the right basketball play and kick it to him, to Westbrook, right. good, more power to you. So LeBron right. keeps trying to make the right play. And <laughs> if we could see that last shot that Westbrook took, what time was it? I got it here somewhere. It was 107 left in the game. He oh, had a three-point shot. LeBron passed yeah, it to him. Yeah, LeBron passed it to him, and it's a three to, to cut it to one. This is a huge shot in this game. Here's Russ. What are you thinking, Russ? And it, it's actually, yeah, he, he got a screen. And not only did he miss, but then Metu came down to the other end and made a three, and all of a sudden you, you're done because now it's a seven-point lead, right? Yes, Okay. yes. So that's where you're relying on a – a cinch, slam dunk, first ballot Hall of Famer to make one shot where you're base, you're, you're uncontested. You're, you're pretty much unguarded. Mm -hmm. You can't get a better shot than that. Right. And all you have to do to beat the Kings is make that shot because the momentum's going to swing. Maybe LeBron can make one more play. You're back in the basketball game. And instead, right. it's game over with that miss and Metu's make. So <laughs> now... I okay, almost let's, skip let's turn it. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I almost pulled the footage of where LeBron was going to come set a screen for Russ to let him get a shot, and he waved LeBron off. He's like, no, nah, I got this one. Yeah. Let me have this one. Let me have oh, this yeah. one. And he, he jacked him. LeBron just okay, dropped his so head. What did Russ say the other day? He said, I am allowed to miss shots, and I'm allowed <laughs> to make turnovers. <laughs> well, are, are you allowed to? to miss 12 shots? No, you're, you're not. I mean, that's just, again, defiantly delusional. Right. You used to be Russell Westbrook, but you're not now. And if, if you could help on the defensive end, we would give no, you no, some no. break and some no, pass, no, no. but he doesn't no. help at all. So no. all of a sudden, LeBron's team ranked number one in defensive efficiency just right. last year yeah. has plummeted to 16th in defensive efficiency. Mm -hmm. And to your point, 70 points in the paint last night and Halliburton saying we we could just get anything we wanted well your worst nightmare this year has been De'Aaron Fox because he's just too quick for even Avery Bradley yes and if we could now see if if you would bear with me on this I know Go it's ahead. just De'Aaron Fox could we see the shots that he made what was it 11 shots that he made yeah 11 of 21 shots. Watch this. Watch where they come from. He made zero threes. Uh, that was Avery Bradley. Got smoked on that one. Come on, somebody. Can, can you guard him, Stanley? Come on. Somebody just just stop ball. Just stop ball. It's a yeah. layup. He's a can't left handed. giving up layups. I know. You can't, come on. You can't, let a guy, you can't let a guy get to his dominant hand. Skip, he's left handed. Yeah. Why you keep letting him go left? Shannon, he's 6'2. Really? These are layups. Look at this. Look at this. Watch this. this. Like, he left oh, really? Get oh, to really? his left. Oh, oh, LeBron, you got to help a little bit. You got to help a little bit. Come on, somebody. 
That was Trevor Ariza. Come on, somebody get in front of him. Malik Monk, no, easy. Layups. It's a layup line. It's a layup drill. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a layup parade. There's one little mid-range. He's pretty good at that. But he, he yes. 0 for 2 from 3, so he didn't even really try many threes. Shannon, you're not going to win that way. You, you have to play a semblance of defense, even Vogel, the first line out of his mouth. I watched his post-game live. He said, we didn't play any defense. Uh, they okay, didn't. well, if you don't play any defense, you're, you're going to miss the playoffs. And, and yes. it's just hard for me to fathom that a LeBron James team, even in year 19, that we'd be talking in the middle of the season, a little past midpoint, about missing the playoffs? Mm-hmm. Come on. Playoffs? I'm not, I'm, Skip. I'm not surprised because we tried, we spoke of this. We foretold of this story. It's like the wise men, Skip. The wise men used to sit around and tell of great tale, great tales of things that have happened or foreshadowing of things to come. We tried to tell everybody that would listen. Just because somebody is a great player doesn't mean they're going to mesh well with other great players. Russell Westbrook was a horrible fit for the Los Angeles Lakers. And I said, and I was thinking to myself, if anybody can make this work, LeBron James can make it work. But nobody thought, nobody thought except the Lakers that this was going to be a great fit. The thing that hurt the Lakers, Skip, is that the Lakers have always gone after names. Dr. But you go back and look at the Lakers, Skip. When Jack, when Jack Kent Cook, he used to own the Lakers. It started out with a Will Chamberlain. And then it went to Kareem. And then it went to Shaq. You look at all the Lakers. LeBron. You look at what they go after. They go after names because it's Tinseltown. We need big names to put butts in these seats. That's why you see, used to see the Jack Nichols, uh, uh, Nicholson. And you see the Denzels. And you see all the great, the, the, the A-list stars sitting courtside. Because they had the big names. But those big names fit. They needed a Shaq. They needed a Kareem. They Agreed. needed a Will. They did not need Russell Westbrook. They did not. There are so many guys that might not have the name that was going to be a much better fit. And I don't think they thought they thought the name, but they forgot the fit. It's all about fit. Parts need to fit. And just because, Skip, you can get a whole bunch of parts, but it doesn't mean it's going to work on your car. Just because it's got a fancy name, you know, hey, a big engine ain't going to fit in the next 10. So, and that's no. what they got. They got a big name, but that it does not fit. Mm-hmm. And it's as simple mm-hmm. as that, Skip. Makes sense. Yeah, it, so, it's not Shannon, fitting, it's not working at all. Yeah, Jenny, allow me to say to Shannon, Yeah. friend to friend, heart to heart, no, they know. I pity you. No, you don't. Not. You love not. it. You love not. it. I know you do. You love it. Not. I pity you. Yes. Not. Yes. No mercy. Well, Mike Parsons was activated off the COVID list, and the Cowboys are sure to need him against the 49ers this weekend. Dallas ranks sixth of seven NFC playoff teams in defending the run, and we all know that San Francisco loves to run. Kyle Shanahan's offensive scheme. So, Shannon, will the 49ers run wild on the Cowboys? I don't know about run wild, but I know they will run the football because this offense, everything they do is predicated on running the football. And they want to minimize Jimmy Garoppolo's involvement in this game. So what they do is that they find a myriad of ways to get the ball to the running back, hand the ball off to Debo Samuels. Even Brandon Ayuk will have a couple of handoffs. And so, Skip, that's what you try to do. A team like the Dallas Cowboys that predicate themselves on pressuring your quarterback forcing him to throw the ball before he's ready. Now our back end can take it away. Or getting our hands on your quarterback and forcing him to turn the football over. But when you're running the ball, and Wes, that's what you've always tried to do. When you find a team that wants to pressure your quarterback, you run the football at at them. And so now it forces them to be able to, you got to stand in there, stop the run, so now you're not going to be able to jump off the football and try to pin your ears back and come get our quarterback. The 49ers can run the football. I think they're fifth uh, uh, in the league in rushing over the last nine games, 140 yards. The Cowboys are like 23rd against rush defense, giving up about four and a half yards of carry skip. So now that's the bottom of the league. So now what you don't want to have to do is sit in there and play the run versus what the 49ers want to do is try to run the football. Now they do have guys that could, that are great run after the catch. You got Kittle, who's a dominant run blocker. Uh, uh, Williams, Trent Williams, the best left tackle in football. Will be back, so if that elbow holds up, he's going to be able to neutralize who's ever going against him. He's legit. He's big time. But when you can run the football, Skip, 
it's a lot easier to pass block because guys are not getting off on the snap of the ball because they got to run. Because if I run up the field, it might be a handoff, and they're running the football just where I left from. So I think the 49ers will run the football. Now, are they going to run the football like they did against the Packers, Skip, that one year in the championship game where Jimmy G threw eight passes? It was almost, Skip, it was almost like a Mac Jones game. It was. With, with, with ideal weather conditions because Jimmy G yep. only threw eight passes and they ran the ball for almost 300 yards. I don't know if they're going to be able to run the football like that. But I do know Kyle Shanahan will make a concerted effort to run the football because that's his best chance because you don't want D-Law, you don't want Gregory, you don't want Michael Parsons and all those guys, the Armstrongs, pinning their ears back, unleashing on Jimmy G. So they're going to run the football. They're, and your concern, what should concern you, Skip, they start getting 30 rush attempts. They get 35, 40 rush attempts. You're going to be in trouble because they're going to control the clock your offense is going to be on the sideline, and your guys are not going to be able to pin your ears back and take the ball away from Jimmy G. So you better hope you can get a lead and take that running game out of it because if you don't, you're going to have a long Sunday afternoon. Mm. Shannon Sharp. Yep. I cannot tell you how sick and tired I am <laughs> of your cowboy hate. <laughs> It just spills. We're not even across from each other today, but it spills through my camera from, what, what are we, 5,000 miles apart. I know 3,000 miles, I guess. 3,000. 3, it feels like 5,000, yeah. But I can feel it coming through my little camera here right into my face, and I have to kind of swim through it, cowboy hate. And I can't wait until next Monday, 9.30 Eastern, Okay. undisputed, I hope you show up oh, because be my Cowboys are going to show up on Sunday at Jerry World, and they are going to beat the 49ers. Okay. I, I get the premise. It, it's, it's glaringly obvious that Kyle Shanahan's trademark is running the football. He's clever, and he's a mastermind of the run game. Is Got he not? It. Give it to you. He, he is. I, I give it to you. Dallas has a fatal flaw that's been disguised and camouflaged all year because they could score so many points so many different ways that the other team couldn't run very much because they fell behind so quickly. I got that. The one blueprint was provided by that guy who's no longer the coach in Denver. I, I don't even <laughs> want to say his name. Oh, Vic Fangio. I, I was angered. <laughs> yeah, old Fangio. I was angered, you recall, a couple of days after the Denver debacle at uh -huh. Jerry World a little earlier this season because Fangio said, I gave you the blueprint. Well, the blueprint was for to, to run for 190 yards against my defense. The yes. blueprint was to get ahead 30 to nothing early in the fourth quarter and then hang on as Dak got back up on that horse and rode it home and at least got to 16 by throwing two touchdown passes to like a fifth-string wide receiver, Malik Turner, and two two-point conversions to get it to 16. So it was 30 to 16. That was a nightmare. That was the blueprint for how to beat my team. But let's look harder at these 49ers this year. They have had a spate of injuries at that running back position, obviously. Yes. There have been a lot of good runners who are not there, not at the disposal of the mastermind Kyle Shanahan this Sunday. Elijah Mitchell is a sixth-round pick out of Louisiana, a rookie, and he's your leading rusher. He's been pretty good, but it seems like anybody Kyle puts in there is pretty good. I feel like Kyle could put me in there, and I, I could be okay. I, I, I would be passable because it's the scheme. The, the scheme seems to work, and they can camouflage Jimmy G and get around old Jimmy Gag and hope to keep him out of harm's way. I get all that, but Elijah Mitchell doesn't horrify me. Debo, yes, but are you going to change Debo's role into straight running back? Because no. It, it, okay, but every time he lines up back there, you know what's about to happen. Some kind of power sweep, or, you know, just tosses yep. to Debo and ho hope that he runs over seven guys and gets 10 yards. Okay. And he will. He's going to run over Yaldo. All right. Okay. I, I hear all that. <laughs> but let's look at the, the actual numbers for this year. Okay. So Kyle's rushing attack ranks seventh in rush yards for the year. Pretty good. Top 10, but not 
dominating. And then let's look at yards per attempt this year. They rank 16th in the NFL. Well, that's that's right in the middle, 4.3 per. Okay, right. I'll give you that. It's kind of mediocre. Pro Football Focus, your Bible, my website. Pro Football <laughs> Focus ranks the 49ers run game 19th in the NFL. Okay, so is it vintage, classic Kyle Shanahan? I, no. I don't think so. But you just okay, said, so, but you just said, given the myriad of injuries that they had, and they're using a sixth-round draft pick that's a rookie. Deep, and they also using Debo Samuel, who's a first, who's a uh, uh, Pro Bowl wide receiver, who he only is. only two only two running backs have more rush touchdowns than he does over the last six weeks, okay. seven weeks of the season. So, given that, shouldn't that scare you that they're starting to get healthy and round into shape for you? What scared me was last year's run defense. It was arguably the worst ever, even though it didn't quite finish at the dead bottom. Houston did last year, but we were 31st. And we, we came around a little bit at the end of the year, but just if I may bring up some very painful memories, my defense last year, as you recall, at home gave up 307 yards to the Cleveland Browns. Yeah. The Odell sort of rubbed it in and, and piled oh, on the with that reverse Yes. Okay, so that's 307. Then we went to Baltimore. It was some weird night, like Tuesday night or whatever it was last year. Remember this one? 294. Not surprising because that's the Ravens. That's what Lamar right. and company do. But 294. Then Kyler and company came to Jerry World on a Monday night and ran wild for 261. And do you remember what happened at Washington? Talk about yeah. a nightmare of a disaster, of a debacle. 208 yards, the Washington football team ran over its arch rival Dallas Cowboys. Okay, so I just gave you four 200-yard-plus games. Right. Well, at least this year, we didn't have any 200-yard-plus. Denver mm -hmm. was the worst at 190. So we, quote-unquote, improved all the way up in, in total yards per game allowed. We, we are all the way up at 113 a game, which ranks 17th. Well, it's pretty good coming from 31st to 17th. So yes. are we at least respectable or passable or average or whatever you want? Yeah, we're average. Yeah. So but I think average. Thing, okay, I, go ahead. Me, Skip, you dodged Christian McCaffrey. I think the biggest thing yeah. for you is that you didn't run into any teams that will be as committed to the running game as the 49ers will be. You also played teams that you were able to get in front of and you took their running game out of it. Now, if you get ahead of the 49ers and take their running game out of it, okay, all bets are off. But I don't believe you're going to be able to race out to a 14, 17, 24 point lead and take their running game completely out of it. So they will be committed. All those other teams that you mentioned, the Cardinals, the Ravens, uh, the Cleveland Browns, they were committed to running the football. And come playoff times, who you are, you must be committed to that. I believe they'll be committed, and I believe they'll expose your team. Your team has not had to face anybody that's as physical as the 49ers will be on Sunday. And on Monday, I hate that I forgot. I, I got Actually, I have a 49ers helmet, and I, I left it. And um, But you better be glad because I was going to wear it on the show on Monday. But I'll find something. I might have George Kittle send me a jersey so I can have that parade around on the show too. <laughs> Go ahead, waste your time, and, and go through the motions of doing that because it will become irrelevant because next Monday will be my day on Undisputed. Okay. It will be my greatest day. It will be the all-time Skip G day because it will okay. be Skip Gloat Day. Skip nah, G, nah. here we go. Nope, it's going to be two right. celebrations going on that day, Skip. Dr. King's birthday and the 49ers victory. Okay. I, I'm... Uh, the, that's going to be my day. It's going to be a double holiday. Who knew? <laughs> okay. Not for you. Double holiday. Yeah. Someone. Okay. All right. So, let, Jenny, last, last quick point. Sunday is going to boil down to this. It's not about this run game versus my lack of run defense. In the end, you know and I know, it's about Rain Dakota Prescott. 
Rain as in R-E-I-G-N. It's actually spelled R-A-Y-N-E, but it's going to be R-E-I-G-N. He's going to reign over the 49ers. Will Dak okay. Prescott on Sunday <laughs> because it's up to him. He makes $75 million this year, and he has to earn it in one day in about three hours at Jerry World on Sunday. Give me three hours of $75 million because – All that has to happen is he has to get hot right out of the box. Sometimes he doesn't. And if he does, and they they jump up 10 to nothing, 14 to nothing, you're cooked. Because at some point, you're going to have to put the game and the ball in Jimmy Gagg's hands. And here we will see what happens. I'll take Dak over Jimmy Garoppolo any day or night. Thank you. If, If I just base it on history in the playoffs, Dak has never started off hot. Go back and look at his resume. Go look at his history. 21 to 3. Look at he had to come try to come back valiantly against the Rams, and the game was nip and tuck down the stretch. So he's really never got off to the start that you're hoping he gets off to come Sunday. Well, against Russell Wilson, he was pretty hot pretty fast. We'll no, see. he was hot late. He made that run one run. Someone's going to be happy on Monday, and I'm going to be sitting back just enjoying watching it all on display. Uh, we got a couple days before this one, so I'm going to step away from the Cowboys and get back to what we saw last night, or really what we didn't want to see. Russell Westbrook had a night to forget, finishing with just eight points on two of 14 shooting in the Lakers' 125-116 loss to the Kings. And after the game, Russ was asked about his struggles, and he mentioned that the media wouldn't be as hard on other players as they are on the former MVP. Still, Westbrook couldn't help himself from giving a little attitude when talking about his slump. Take a listen. Russ, you're you're in a a little bit of a shooting slump here over these last four games, but... Man, who are you telling? (laughs) Uh, Make a shot, boy. Did you hear what they played? They played like Uh -uh. ice when you got introduced. Who? The arena? Yeah. That's funny. Uh, um, they played that. I hope they played that the last 14 years, too. <laughs> it's funny they play it now. That's cute. I kind of like that from him. Okay, Shannon, is Westbrook tarnishing his legacy? No. This season is a continuation of the way Russell Westbrook has played the previous 13. Skip, what if I told you Russell Westbrook is shooting 43 point, 43.7% from the floor? The exact same percent that he shot the previous 13 years. What if I told you Russell Westbrook is shooting 29% from the three? He shot 30% for the better for his entire career. So only thing has happened is that he can't do us just with the triple-double. So now this is who he is. This is who Russell Westbrook is. Now the only thing that's working against him, Skip, is he's not as athletic. Russ has really never played defense. So now you're unathletic, you're, 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 you're just as inefficient as you've always been, you're still just as ball dominant, but you can't be as ball dominant because LeBron James has the ball in his hands more than you, but it's not going to char- char- uh, uh, tarnish his image. This is who Russ is, a guy that plays out of control, that's inefficient, that turns the ball over at a high rate, that doesn't shoot the three well, that doesn't shoot the free throw well, and doesn't play defense. So what has changed this year, Skip, as opposed to what he's been the previous 13 years? It just so happens he's got a bigger spotlight on him. He's with the Lakers. Skip, last year with the the Washington Wizards, nobody cared. He's with the Houston Rockets. Nobody cared. He's with OKC. Nobody cared. Once Kevin Durant left, nobody cared about the OKC Thunder. So he was able to, Skip, play the exact same way he's playing currently, (coughs) get triple doubles, and everybody was seduced by that. But now he's on a big stage, and you're trying to win a championship. And you're like, you go back and look at his numbers, you're like, hold on. These are the exact same numbers he's had his whole career. He's shooting the exact same percent from the floor. He's shooting the exact, shit, Skip, he's 29, 29% from the three this year. He's 30% for his first 13 years. So to make a long story short, and I, I hated that I made the long story, uh, uh, the short story long, This is who Russ is. It just so happens he's playing for the Laker. There's more media attention. There's more expectations. And he hasn't rose to the moment. As simple as that. Okay. I just want our viewers to let this sink in. It came to this last night for Russell (laughs) Westbrick. They're at Sacramento. 
against a team that has lost five straight, six of seven, a pathetic team, and also ran in the West. Mm -hmm. And once upon a time, not long ago, they were the consensus pick, the Lakers, to win the West. Right. During introductions, they play the foreigner song, Cold as Ice. You're as cold as ice. They're clowning Russell Westbrook, the Lakers' starting point guard. They're clowning him. And then as he started to West Brick his shots, they're playing Ice Ice Baby by Vanilla Ice, a.k.a. (laughs) Robbie Van Winkle. I used to know Robbie back in my days in Dallas. And you want to talk about the all-time one hit wonder, one hit wonder. Ice Ice Baby. Well, Great, it was the all greatest time. Greatest one hit wonder hey, eight ever. Ever, ever. But but they're playing it. By the way, he stole the hook, but that's a whole nother thing. But <laughs> we, we get into that later. But the point is, they're playing that to clown the Lakers' starting point guard, a slam dunk first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah. Just because four of the last five years, he averaged a triple double. Well, yeah. the first time he did it, we were in awe on Undisputed. We just sat back and said, my God, didn't think that would ever happen. Oscar no. had done it way back when in the early 60s. 61, 62. Yeah. And how could you do that? And he won the MVP because of it. And then he rinsed and repeated it. Wow. Four or five times. I, I thought it was humanly impossible to do that. And yet to have a six-foot-three-inch guard to rebound and get 10 a game for 82 or however many games he would play, is it's it's astonishing. It's unheard of. It's impossibly great. So we give him that. And even this year, if I told you, Shannon, your starting point guard was averaging 19-8-8, and just in the big picture, in a vacuum, you'd say, wow, that's pretty good numbers, right? 19-8-8? I mean, you can you can make the All Star team with nineteen eight and eight. That's sort of like absolutely. Ben. What aren't, aren't those kind of Ben Simmons numbers, right? Is yeah, that what he yeah. would do? Nineteen eight and eight, right? Yeah. Okay. This is classic. Be careful what you wish for, Russell Westbrook. His dream, his whole career was to re- return home and play point guard for the Lakers. He grew up living and dying for. He's really the only Laker who grew up in the neighborhood, grew up out here in Southern California in L.A., rooting from first memory for the Lakers. So Mm -hmm. his dream came true, and it became his worst nightmare because, to your point, all of a sudden he's on a huge stage. Mm -hmm. And our man Chris Haynes asked him late in the same interview that we just saw the clip from about, man, how does it feel you know, you, you're this fan has a fandom ever come down harder on a player than they are on you? Well, I don't know, maybe not. But let me ask you: Does he not deserve to be come down upon right yeah. now? Because, my goodness, you, you're shooting twenty eight point eight percent from three. It ranks one hundred and fiftieth of one hundred and fifty four. You're the point guard on the team that was the consensus pick to win it all. To win it all, to win the West, I think a lot of people had them, some people did anyway, winning it all, but, but at least to win the West. And you're shooting 65.6% from the free throw line, which ranks 97th out of 99 qualified free throw shooters. It, it's so bad. And then, of course, you're leading the league in turnovers by plus, uh, what are you on James Harden, plus 19 over James Harden. It, it's so bad that it, it You can't overcome it. You can't rise above that. So he deserves the criticism. I I don't blame Laker Nation for condemning him because he is turned into Russell Westbrook on the the, the biggest stage. And and when he says things like, hey, I'm allowed. I'm allowed to miss shots and and make turnovers. Well, not that many. Right. Because yeah. you're you're killing your the team that you love. So yes. so to me, I, I disagree. I think his his legacy is getting tarnished because he's getting exposed for the first time in 14 years. He laughed and said or short, chuckled about, you know, would they been playing those songs for the last 14 years? Nobody cared. No, nobody. You, you, you weren't the Lakers starting point guard. Right. As you point out. You were in Washington or Houston or Oklahoma City. Nobody really cared. Nobody. And when they did care about you, you had riding shotgun 
uh, that big seven foot monster. You had you had Kevin Durant over here, right. and you had James Harden coming off the bench. That's when they cared about you. And if you had a bad night, they did not, and you got to the finals because of it. So yeah. to me, uh, th- this is a bad, wrong place, wrong time for Russell Westbrook. Skip, my grandpa used to tell my brother now. He says, "I'm only disappointed in you because I expected better from you." I can't be disappointed in Russ because this is what I expected from him. People get expected in a relationship. You get you get disappointed in your partner because you didn't expect them to do that or they did something you didn't expect them to do. If you expect somebody to do something, Skip, how can you be disappointed if you expected it? This is who I saw Russ to be. I know what he is. I've seen enough. I've watched this man from Oklahoma City to Houston, to Washington, now in L.A. He cannot disappoint me because this is what I expected of him. You can only be disappointed if you expect something from someone. If you expect them to do what they do, if they did what you expect them to do, how are you disappointed? You expected them to do it. Skip, I expected him to shoot 30%. I expected him to be inefficient. I expected him to turn the ball over. So why am I disappointed? I might be disappointed because he's doing it for my team. Hell, I wasn't disappointed when he did it for Washington because I had no skin in the game. I didn't, when he did it for OKC, I got no skin in the game. But Skip, this Skip, if you look at his career, Skip, this is a microcosm. This year in L.A. is a microcosm of Russell Westbrook's career. He's shooting the exact same percent from the floor, 43.7. The last three years, he shot 29% from the three. He's a 30% career three-point shooter. Skip. How are you disappointed when he's doing what you thought he would do? But now he can't seduce you night in and night out, although he does lead no. the NBA in triple-doubles. Skip, normally 40 games into the season, Russ would have 20 triple-doubles. So now he yep. can't seduce you with that to make you look away like, damn, hey, man, Russ had 10 turnovers. Russ had nine turnovers. Now, Skip, you go 2 of 14, got eight points, and you, and you turn the ball over. He only had one last night. But Skip, I'm not disappointed. I'm not disappointed in Russ because this is who I know Russ to be. Skip, you can't. Skip, I'm not upset when the Lions eat somebody. What was the like? He being a lion. I'm not upset yeah. at Russ. He being Russell Westbrook. That's what. That's who he is. Okay, but I think you would agree with me that both of us have realized because we now watch him very closely every, every single <laughs> dribble every yes. night. Yes. That he has the worst hands of any point guard we've no ever question. seen. No, zero, they're, they're just zero. terrible. Well, I, I never thought of that in Oklahoma City or Houston or Washington. I, I just didn't focus on that. Right. And it, it's so bad that <clears throat> we talk about him being a natural-born left-handed player. Mm-hmm. His left-handed lay-ins, lay-ups, dunk attempts are, are horrendously, wildly erratic. We we yes. can't seem to hang on to the basketball. There's no touch. There's no feel. Th- there's no real rhythm to it. And after a while, it's so bad that it makes you look back at all the stats that say, well, wait a second. He led the league in turnovers four times before he got to L.A., and he was second four other times. Now he's going to lead the league in turnovers a fifth time. And I realize the Pro Basketball Hall of Fame is not like the Pro Football Hall of Fame, but mm-hmm. it it would bring into question whether Russell Westbrook should be a first ballot Hall of Famer, even though he clearly will be. But yeah. but if you look harder at the stats, the turnovers, the inability to win basketball games because he becomes more of a detriment than a, an attribute, that. After a while, in the harder process that is your Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, I think it would get questioned as a first ballot Hall of Fame body of work. Seriously. I think football voters would look harder and say, well, time out. Wait a second. Is that first ballot? Well, Skip, because if you look at it, Joe Namath has more interceptions than touchdowns, and he's in the Pro Football okay. Hall of Fame. Right. I look okay. at it like this, it. We Skip. We can keep doing that, but go yeah. ahead. But, let me ask you, but how about this here, Skip? Tell me the time you saw a quarterback lead a team to the Super Bowl, and he led the league in interceptions. So how are you going to get to the NBA Finals, Skip, if your guy leads the league in turnovers? How? 
Well, yeah, I mean, Eli, but, yeah, Eli led it in, in interceptions three times, three, but I can't yeah, remember if one of those but, three was in a Super Bowl yeah, year. I don't yeah, think Yeah, we, we have to look and go back and look and see if it was in a yeah. Super Bowl season. But, yeah, he did, Skip. But, Russ, Skip, but, Skip, I'm not this, – this is who he is. If you look at his numbers, his numbers are identical to what he's been for the previous 13 season. It just so happens, yeah, okay. Skip, he's in L.A. You know everything is in there. You know everything is in the spotlight of microcosm. And that was the question yeah. people had about Anthony Davis. Okay, it's yeah. one thing to put those numbers up in New Orleans when nobody gives a damn. Can you still bring those yeah. same numbers to L.A. with the expectations of you to win a championship? Nobody thought Anthony Davis was winning a championship in, in New Orleans. Now, Russ, nobody thought you were winning a championship in Washington <laughs> or Houston or OKC once KD left. Now... You're with LeBron. Now you're with AD. AD's injured. Hadn't played well even though before he got injured. But the expectations that comes along with you being in L.A. But for me, this is who Russ is. And anybody thinks he's anything other than that have not been watching him play the lion's share of his career. Because he's a turnover, inefficient, ball-dominant guy. Last quick point. Not only is he on the Los Angeles Lakers stage, the, the stage of Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and obviously Kobe Bryant and Shaq. But he's playing alongside LeBron James. It's hard to play alongside LeBron because if it doesn't work, the spotlight will land on you. Why are you not helping him enough? Why are right. you impeding him from winning? He's scoring 30-something a game. It's your fault. And right. it's always been hard to play with LeBron. Ask Kevin Love. Ask anybody all the way back to the yeah. early Cleveland days. Mm -hmm. And he is now, it, it's like nightmare come true as opposed to dream come true. So he is in for a rough ride unless he can clean up his act, and I do not believe he's capable. Skip, doesn't Brett Favre hold the NFL record for the most career interceptions? Yeah. Brent Roethlisberger just most broke his most sack record. We still remember Brett Favre as a three-time MVP that won the Super Bowl. We're going to remember Russell Westbrook. We're going to disregard the field goal percentage, the three-point percentage, the free throw percentage. Here's a guy that's going to have over 200 triple doubles who won an MVP. That's how he's going to be remembered, Skip. I don't believe this is going to tarnish his legacy. I, I don't, mm -hmm. but it's not going to tarnish for me because he is what he is. Skip. Well, it's tarnishing yeah, my view. You know what, him. Skip? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't buy this pen thinking all of a sudden it was going to be a car that I'm going to be able to trade. You know, like, oh no, this might be a Ferrari. It's an ink pen. Mm. Russell Westbrook yeah, is what he yeah. is. No mercy. Cooper Cup led the league in catches, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns, becoming the fourth receiver ever to win the Triple Crown, joining Steve Smith in 2005, Shannon's brother Sterling Sharp in 1992, and Jerry Rice in 1990. And in USA Today, Mike Freeman wrote an article about him that took specific note of a conversation that you two had earlier this season, pointing out that as a white wide receiver, he often gets overlooked in the conversation of the best pass catchers in the league. So, Shannon, what is your perspective on this? Well, I think I, I think Cooper Cup has had an unbelievable season. And I even tweeted, Skip, I think he's had a historically great season, but I don't think he's the best receiver in football. I think that distinction go, goes to Devontae Adams. And normally what yep. I like to do, Skip, I like to see guys put together seasons for an extended period of time. I'm not saying you can't be great, but I need to see before I say anoint you number one, I need to see it over a period of time. Skip, he has 51 more catches than his previous high. He has nearly 800 more yards than his career high. He has six more touchdowns than his career high. So is this is this a written? Obviously, I don't expect 145, 8, 1900, and 15, 14, 15 touchdowns, Skip, to be a norm. But he primarily plays the slot position. We haven't had a whole lot of historically great slot black receivers. Skip, you compare left tackles to left tackles. You compare guards to guards. You compare quarterbacks to quarterbacks, running backs to running backs. That's just what you do. And, it's, and, I'm, and I, don't, I didn't mean it as a, uh, as a knock, but Julian Edelman was a great slot receiver. Wes Welker was a great slot receiver. Now, obviously, they thought a lot more of him than they did those guys because Wes Welker was an undrafted free agent. 
uh, uh, Julian Edelman was a seventh round receiver, uh, uh, quarterback that switched positions. Cooper Cup was a third round receiver. Skip, when you go to a small school and you get drafted high, the production has to be off the charts. So clearly his numbers at Eastern Washington, I think that's where he went, if I'm not mistaken. Numbers had yeah. to be off the chart. So Skip, when we compare, I'm comparing him because I'm not comparing him to like Devontae and guys that mainly, now Devontae does do work inside the numbers, but a lot of his work is done outside the numbers, Skip. Of 101, of Cooper Cup's 145 catches, 70% of them went less than 10 yards. Only 10% of his catches went for 20 yards down the field. He had only one touchdown that was 20 yards or more. Skip, I mean, it is, it's not a knock. And I get it. When we look mm-hmm. at Skip, he is a wide receiver. And we haven't seen a wide receiver put up these historic numbers ever before. You got Skip, you got to go back to Charlie Hennigan, and you got to go way, way, way back. But he is a phenomenal receiver. But in order for me to say he's the best, I'm going to see, even if he doesn't put up another season like he had this year, I'm going to need to see more of that because I've seen Devontae do it three, four years in a row now, Skip. I've seen some of these other guys. I've seen what Tyreek has done over a period of time. And so that's all I'm saying. He is phenomenal. He had a phenomenal season. The elephant in the room is he's a white player in a predominantly black position, Skip. Let's not, let's not, let's not sugarcoat that. Just like how we look at Christian right. McCaffrey. I mean, they haven't been a whole, they're not a whole lot of white running backs in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Skip. Sp- especially no. since, the, if we go back since, what, 1980? You're going to go back to, what, Zonka, what, Zonka retired before the 80, and uh, uh, the guy at Washington, Skip, uh, John Riggins. Yep. So, he had a phenomenal season. He's a phenomenal talent. He has great speed. Uh, he's not what you skip. He's not a burner. But I look at his short shuttle. All I need to know, a guy like him, what does he do in the short shuttle? What's his first 10? What's his three cone? You look at his three yep. cone, it's going to stack up favorable to anybody. And that's where he mm-hmm. does the most of his work. But he had a phenomenal season, Skip. And so if he was offended by something that I said, I apologize. I understand his greatness. But I can't say he's the best receiver in football because I've only seen one year of, of production. And you're talking about who would be offended, the writer or no, no, no. Cup. Cup, if Cup, if Cup is offended yeah, yeah. by okay, something right, I said, okay. no, okay, no, no, no. I don't. Jared, I, Jared's not offended. It's Mike Freeman wrote this. Oh, we Mike Freeman. Okay, allow I know me Mike to say. <clears throat> so speaking of those two, two of the strongest, most respected black voices in sports media, Mike Freeman, who wrote this piece for USA Today, and, and our friend Jared Bell, the pro football columnist at USA Today. And I appreciated what Mike wrote here because it was insightful and it was gutsy and there's much truth here. But sometimes, and I'll get to more of of what he wrote, the depth of it, but to your first point, Shannon, sometimes stereotypes are just fact. It's just a fact. (laughs) And yeah, and, and again, does Cooper get dismissed a little bit? Does he get undersold, um, undervalued because he's a white receiver? And they do split him out sometimes. He moves all right. around, but, but mm-hmm. I, I get you. Primarily, he's a slot receiver because he's hard to cover in the slot. Right. But Mike's point here is he took Devontae coming out at the combine before the draft and same draft, Cooper Cup, and compared their measurables, and they were – Pretty close. You can yes. sort of do two peas in a pod because Devonte has gotten way better than than what he timed. It was four, five, six at the combine, right? And he he did bench press fourteen times two twenty five, which is p- pretty good That's for pretty a wide good receiver, for a while, especially yeah, of his build. Is. Yeah, uh, Cooper did not even dare to try the bench press <laughs> at that point, but he ran four six two. Well, there's a certain thing called how fast are you with the football under your arm? Right. Cooper Cup is fast. He, he, is, he is legit fast because he can get behind you. Maybe it's because you underestimate, but I think he has legitimate football speed that is underestimated or he wouldn't be able to do what he does. Yes. Because it's not all just little underneath option routes. He, oh, yeah. he runs downfield routes and gets True. deep behind people. 
Skip, this is what okay. I tell you. What, let, me, let me say this, Skip. There's a difference between timing fast and playing fast. There are yeah. guys that can, that can run 4-3, but with the ball in their hand and the way they play, Skip, they run 4-6. And there are guys that time 4-6 that Jerry Rice, with the ball in his hand, look like he ran 4-2. There's a difference between okay. timing fast and playing fast. Thank you. Now, let's look at the sort of recent history of white wide receivers, not slot receivers, wide outs, XY receivers. Okay. Well, Jordy. Jordy Nelson was was a good one, and Aaron yeah. Rodgers loved him, and he was really yes. good. He wasn't just a slot receiver, he was a wide receiver. Jordy could and fly those skip. He could fly big <laughs> and, and fast. Yes. I, I think. I think Adam Thielen is shattering the mold right now because he's yeah. he's pretty good and he will line up wide and he will yes. beat you wide, right? Yes, yes. And and then we go back to your Broncos. We go back to Eric Decker, who and, was pretty good, not not yeah, a football oh yeah. receiver, but pretty good wide receiver, big, strong, yeah. fast. Yes. And then you played with a tall, fast wide receiver named McCaffrey, the father yeah, he, of, right? Yeah, he went to the Pro go Bowl ahead. in '96. He went to the Eddie Eddie Mack went to the Pro Bowl. I think Deck made the Pro Bowl one year, Skip. I think he did. I think he did. Okay. So there are the, the ones that stick out, but there, there aren't that many of them. And if we flip it to the cornerback position, <laughs> there, there are none. I, I don't yeah. know. W- w- where do we have to go back to? The, uh, who was it for uh, the Giants? Back Jason Seahorn. Jason yeah, Seahorn. Seahorn. Okay. Is that the last starting white cornerback? Yeah. So it, are we stereotyping there? It just, no. It's a fact. There, there just right. aren't any. That they, right. they're, no. it, it, it's, um, it's extinct. That, that right. breed is extinct, I guess you'd say. I, I played okay. against Scott Case, Skip. I know you remember Scott Case out but, of Oklahoma. Do I? University of Oklahoma. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Edmund, Oklahoma. Thank you very much. No, I, I got it. But he was more of a safety than a corner. He so transitioned to, to yeah, he safety. transitioned, yes, he did. Okay. All right. So we know all kinds of slot receivers, the Edelmans, the Amendolas, we could go. You, you played the with uh, uh, Stokely. You, Stokely, you, you yep. played at Baltimore with Stokely. He was really good. Okay, yes. but they're all out of that same sort of. If we are stereotyping that same sort of mold. Okay, so I got that. So now back to Mike's point, and and I do love this, and I want to reread it. But his first point is it, it's almost as if the brains of people can't compute that a white receiver is dominating a sport that's approximately seventy percent black. Okay. So, so they fall back on stereotypes. Okay, I, I got it. it. It is sort of hard to get through your head that he's doing what he's doing. So I, I appreciate that. And then Mike Freeman goes on to write, stereotypes are the nuclear fission of hate and racism. Bingo. Agree. Right. And then he concludes that there's also the reverse stereotype. If a white player is praised as crafty and hardworking, that can mean black players are, are successful strictly because of physical Talent. prowess. Their, Correct. their craftiness is diminished. Okay, right. boom, bingo. True. Got it. And, and I appreciate all of the above because it, it gets murky in there because you do get the reverse stereotype that is completely unfair to black receivers who are very hardworking and crafty and so whatever you want to yes. say. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, but Skip, for me, he does break the mold in one aspect, Skip. Normally, slot receivers are somewhere between like 5'9", 5'10", 5'11". Yeah. 190, maybe 195, 185, 195. He's a big kid, Skip. He's like 6'2", probably 2'10". So he's a lot bigger than what you would think of as a traditional slot receiver. He He has. I agree. He, because he's bigger, Skip, he's just as crafty, he's just as shifty, because all these guys, Skip, because you're running your, you're running your routes in a very confined area. There's a lot of collisions yep. that's going to take, there's a lot of impact that's going to happen instantaneous. The Got difference it. is with him, Skip, is that he's able to get down the field a lot quicker than, say, Edelman, Amendola, Welker, Cole Beasley, Stoke, who I played with in Baltimore, Brandon Stokely. So, yes. Skip, I just need to see more production. Now, if he comes back and follows okay, it up with enough. another 1,500-yard season, sure. we're going to have to have All a right. conversation. Okay, okay, Devontae, what, what did you do? Okay, fair enough. But I'm with you. If, if you made me take one right now, I'm, I'm Devontae all day. I, yes. I just think 
he's a little more explosive than Cooper Cup is. I, I right. get you. Okay, last quick point. For those who closely followed the Georgia Bulldogs, now the national champions of college football, yeah. that kid Brock Bowers for them, yeah. uh, he is a white kid, and he is 6'4", <laughs> about 230, and he's kind of a hybrid tight end wide receiver. I think yeah, he's yeah, more yeah. wide receiver than tight end. Right. Shannon, he's freakish. I, yeah. I don't care if he's white or black or green or yellow or pink. He is freakish. His he, game is more like, like he runs Kelsey. four five. Yeah. He, he, his, okay, his, game, his, ga- his game mirrors Kelsey. Uh, he's okay. not he's not as violent of a runner as a George Kittle. No. He's not as dominant of a blocker. He's not a violent runner like a uh, uh, Gronk. He's more he's more shifty. He's more crafty like a like a uh, Kelsey. Kelsey plays great in space. He's fluid. You see how well he moves at a man his size. Yeah. I mean, me moving at my size, Skip, I was 6'2", 228. Kelsey's 6'4", six, 6'5", 255, maybe 260. Moving like okay, that, like it. a Gronk in his prime. So that kid, okay. that kid's going to be special, Skip. If he could come out, he's gonna he'll be, be a first-round pick if he could come out this year. I oh, agree, absolutely. but Shannon, I think he can fly. I think he's yeah. four or five. I think he's faster than Travis Kelsey. He yeah. is, and he's so young. I mean, this is just the beginning for him, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A lot of potential when you're already playing like that as a freshman. No mercy. Sunday on Fox, Jalen Hurts and the Eagles look to dethrone the reigning champs as they take on the GOAT, Tom Brady and the Bucks. It all kicks off 1 Eastern with pregame coverage starting at 11 a.m. Only on Fox, all part of Super Wild Card Weekend. And speaking of that matchup, TB12 is looking to win his eighth Lombardi Trophy this postseason and his second in a row since moving to Tampa. While last season presented its own challenges of learning a new system and navigating the early days of the pandemic, this year's path for the Buccaneers has been filled with injuries, not to mention a target on their back as defenders the champ. So Shannon, which has been the tougher road to the Super Bowl for Tom Brady last year or what he's dealing with right now this season? I think last year, no question, was a tougher year because you came into a uh, wow. you came into a very unfamiliar situation. You came in during the pandemic, and I think last year you were the number five seed. So every game that you played, you had to go on the road. This year, you're number two seed, and theoretically, you could play every game at home. If if the cards roll your way, you would be at home. If I'm not mistaken, you brought everybody back. The reason why it's so hard to repeat is a lot of times some of your best players are uh, 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 contracts up. And they go to Green of Pastors. You brought everybody back. That was the whole purpose of you bringing everybody back was to do what? Skip Bayless told me Tom Brady is the MVP. And he said it was a travesty. Echoing what Bruce Arians says, it's a travesty if he doesn't win. So how, if you're two seed this year, you're the MVP, uh, and you're going to have at least two games at home if you win, how is it a more difficult road this year than it was last year when you had to go on the road, you had to take your show on the road all three weeks? No, it's not even close. What Skip is trying to do is that he's trying to sell you, if he wins it this year, there's no question about it. I'm not going to let you do it, Skip. I can't even good conscience mm-hmm. let you sell that to the American public, that Tom Brady's this year is more difficult than last year, given everybody told me Tom Brady was going to be better. Everybody told me this offense was going to be better. They told you they were going to be better. So now it's going to be harder? Uh, No, no chance. Zero chance. Shannon Sharp, if Tom Brady manages to pull this off this year, it will be much more special than even last year No, 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 no. That that wasn't the question. That wasn't the question. No, no, it wasn't no special. The, The question was tougher. Is it more difficult? I don't mean special. More difficult. Much more difficult. But before I launch on that, I I would like to interject. You've been needling me about this, and I finally (laughs) went back and looked it up just to pile on to my MVP argument for Brady. You keep saying, well, what about air distance this year? He led the league in air distance last year. What about this year? Well, I finally remembered to look it up. He led the league in air distance again. Aaron yeah. Rodgers was 12th in air distance. That's how far the ball travels to the receiver. What about completion? Aaron Rodgers was 12th? Wow. Yeah. Interesting. But how completion huh. percentage did Brady? But go ahead. Make your point. I'm listening. Huh. Okay. Now, this is why this road is so much tougher than it was a year ago. All those players who wanted to run it back 
They all came back. Many of them took hometown discounts. Shaq Barrett isn't right. He's trying to practice this week, but I don't know if he's going to even be remotely close to 75% healthy. JPP, they'll be lucky if he's 75% of what he was at this time a year ago when those two took over pass rushing through the playoffs. Levante David is still very iffy to return at all, and I'm, I'm going to doubt that they will have him against Philadelphia this time around. Jamel Dean is now nicked, and they're saying he is iffy, if not doubtful, to play this time in the first playoff game against Philadelphia. Richard Sherman is down and out completely. They had to injure reserve him, so he, he gave it a great shot. They could have really used him, and he's gone. And just when I thought Tom Brady had discovered a deep threat, a new A.B., the, the guy he hit in the walk-off throw against the Jets, Cyril Grayson, undrafted out of LSU, he's pulled his hamstring so badly it sounds like he's going to be gone for a while, if not for the whole playoffs. Now that brings me back to the top. Obviously, there's no more A.B. I've argued that could be a good thing because it can galvanize, reunite, re-energize, reignite this football team. But he's not there. And he was there for at Washington. He was there for at New Orleans. He did get hurt in that game, but he did play in that, uh, the game at New Orleans. And then he was not there for Green Bay at Green, Green Bay. Bay, but he was there for the Super Bowl. So mm-hmm. he had A.B., and A.B. became his primary target over the last eight games last year. So he is gone. So now let's look at this year's regular season stats, shall we? Who led the Buccaneers in targets this year? Huh. Chris Godwin did, and that was 13 more than Mike Evans. Chris Godwin is gone. Who led this team in catches this year? 24 more than Mike Evans. Chris Godwin did. Chris Godwin is gone. Huh. Who who led in yards receiving for the Buccaneers this regular season? Oh, it was Chris Godwin with 1,103, which was 68 more yards than Mike Evans. Tom Brady has lost his primary threat at receiver. The guy that you, the Hall of Famer Shannon Sharp, keeps telling me is going to be a big hole in the arsenal because he is a primary possession type receiver for Thomas mm-hmm. Edward Patrick Brady Jr. And he is no longer there. You don't think my- this is a tougher road with no Chris Godwin and no AB and, and a defense that has fallen to pro football focus ranks them 10th overall. It, it, last year they took off. They were the best defense. Now, now he's got maybe the 10th best defense. You're so, kidding me. This is a much tougher road than it was a year ago. So they still have Tom Brady. They still have that healthy offensive line. Mike Evans has sort of set a uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneer receiving touchdown record. They still have the GOAT tight end in Gronk. And you said it doesn't matter. Tom Brady five makes, got, makes guys rise to the occasion. Uh, Perriman steps up to the occasion. Cameron Brake, you still have O.J. Cameron? Howard. Oh, oh, yeah, oh absolutely. You, hold on. But, and you got the MVP. We don't make excuses for MVPs, right? That's mm. not what you did well, with Aaron no, Rodgers. we're just talking about harder road this year. So, you, so let me ask you a question. You think it's harder to play on the road or play at home? Okay, who's the tougher opponent in a first round matchup, even in Tampa? It's Philly. Philly is a better football team than Washington was at the end of the year last year with Taylor Uh, Tyler Heineke. Skip, you know, first of all, Washington football team took them down to the wire and they needed they needed a catch to secure that victory. I got it. No, so I I got it. But at, at, at home, you're at home. You know the system. You have a year up under your belt. You told me. Everybody that just babbed it in my head, this team is going to be better than what they were last year. The offensive line is better than what they were last year. Mike Evans is better than what he was last year. He didn't have near the number of production as far as touchdowns as he had last year. Gronk has come on strong. Gronk, Skip, I remember last year, Gronk, they only used Gronk a handful of times in the regular season. It was almost as if they were saving him for the playoffs. But Gronk has been really productive this year. Yeah, he missed the five games with that lung injury, but Gronk is Gronk. So I disagree. Okay, I don't they, think it, go ahead. Are they healthier this year than they were last year? No, not even close. No, you didn't worry about one guy being healthy. That's what you tell me. You tell me it's a quarterback-driven league. You didn't make that excuse for Patrick Mahomes when he went to the Super Bowl with five different offensive linemen. No, 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 okay. no, no. You said it's the quarterback. It's a quarterback league. 
Quarterbacks play well. Okay, but the quarterback you have tried to retire each of the last five years is now 44 years of age. When you're advancing into your middle 40s playing quarterback at a high level, wouldn't it seem like the road would just get tougher the next year just because no. you added another year of life? You went no. from 43 to 44? So oh. it's diminishing returns. That's what you told me about Russell Westbrook. You're well, losing athleticism. Yeah, but, but Skip, he doesn't play. First of all, he's reliant on the guys around him. Now, you told me. Now, what is it? Now, you told me that the other guys didn't have any bearing. I said that, you know, he left Tampa. One of the reasons he left New England is because the talent has started to d d uh, diminish. The talent pool wasn't what it once was. And he, and, but you are like, oh, no, no, they were 79. Oh, that, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin and those guys, they didn't have anything to do with the resurgence that we saw in Tom Brady. Now that Chris Godwin is, possibly, is, is out, there's no A.B. No. You want to make it about talent. Is it about talent or is it about the quarterback? It's about tougher road. And the only thing that gets diminished on this show is Brady's achievements in your eyes. You continue no, no, to no, diminish no. everything no, that no, he pulls no, off. No, 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 that's not what I do. What I do do is that I hold you accountable when you try to diminish the guys around him and make it just about Brady. If you were to give the defense credit, you see, when Brady lost the Super Bowl, you blamed his defense. You didn't say, well, Brady did yeah. what he was supposed to do. No, Brady didn't play well. Just acknowledge Brady did not play well in those two giant Super Bowls. Which Bowl. Super Bowl? I, I the don't two know what you're talking about. The two giant ones. The two that he lost the to The first Eli. one? He played he, well, He had Skip. a game-winning drive. Got see, canceled by Belichick's see, choking defense. See, you, you see what you do, Skip? You see that? I, I no, just do the facts. Skip. So, in other words, as long as something... Now, see, I've seen Aaron Rodgers. I've seen other guys have game-winning drives. And you don't give them the credit that you give Tom Brady for a game when he drives. Tom Brady did not play well in either of the Giants Super Bowls. They lost. The only Super Bowl that okay, he played I'll well. I'll give you the second one, not the first one. Skip, he scored 14 points. How does your quarterback play well who's a unanimous MVP score 14 points when he averages scored 37? Well, we don't have because to live in against the past a very good defense, they're up Brady. 14 to 10. Very good defense. Either way, now. we've been talking about what Tom is doing and what he could do. He's trying to repeat right now, guys, and tough task at hand. And, you know, he always likes to be motivated by the hate from Shannon. So thank you, Shannon, <laughs> yeah. for continuing to motivate <laughs> Mr. Tom Brady. No mercy. Ben Simmons still hasn't played for the 76ers this season. And the newest report from Woj said that his agent, Rich Paul, met with Philadelphia's front office to discuss the stalemate about the guard's future. But apparently, nothing has changed in the past few months. With the all-star guard apparently no closer to a return to the court in Philadelphia, they're still determined to bring back a significant player in any trade. So, Shannon, do you ever see Ben Simmons playing for the Sixers again right now? I don't. Wow. Skip, when we talked about this, Skip, after they lost to the Game 7 in Atlanta, and Doc Rivers said what he said, and Joel Embiid said what he said, Skip, I said it was over. You believe they could mend the fence and say Doc Rivers is going to get in the room with Ben Simmons? I said, no, it's not. I said, you can't say that there's no coming back from what he said. There's no coming back from what Joel Embiid said. So I was very clear in that. Skip, this now this is a matter of pride. Daryl Morey wants to, say, wants to basically say, well, if he's not going to play for us, he's not playing for anybody. But what you're doing by doing this is that you're wasting ben, another one of Joel Embiid's seasons. How many seasons, how many more injury, because he's been relatively injury-free this year, but you're wasting Joel Embiid's career. You're not going to get the value that you want for the simple fact everybody knows you've got to trade Ben Simmons. They know he does no longer want to be there. And by that, Skip, I'm not giving you top dollar when I know you've got to get off it. I know you've got to move it. Everybody knows you've got to move it. He's made it abundantly clear. You see in these videos, Skip, he got a cell phone in his pocket. He's loudly gagging. He's, you know, he's shuffling like, man, I don't want to be here. I want everybody to see that I don't want to be here. So, Skip, it's best that you go try to get the best package you could get. Maybe you can get some draft picks and keep it moving. But you're not going to get the player back or players back that you want to return. Because everybody knows Ben doesn't want to be there, and they know eventually you're going to have to get up off him. You're going to have to. He's not playing for the 76ers again. I don't know where he ends up, Skip. I don't know. But I just know he's not playing in Philly again. Hmm. Shannon Sharp. <clears throat>
the one thing I respect about your man LeBron James is he has moved. He has gone, obviously, from Cleveland to Miami to Cleveland to L.A. But every time LeBron moved, he had the right to move. Correct. In this case, Ben Simmons has not one or two years left on his deal. He has yeah. four years left on his contract. Yeah. He signed it in good faith because they signed it in good faith. And it is offensive to me that here we go again with another NBA player attempting to just force his way out of town because he doesn't like the way he got treated at the end of a game mm-hmm. in which he did stink it up. He did. Obviously, over the Atlanta series, he lost it at the free throw line. He let the demons get a hold of his psyche and just chomp away at it. And he started to run from the later game free throw line. And we saw him turn down. Obviously, it looked like a dunk because he was afraid to have to shoot if he got fouled the free throws. And I can't condemn Joel and Doc for what they said after the game because it's in the heat of the moment. They had lost a game seven at home and it was eating them up. And they spilled just as as you might have spilled moments after losing to Mark Brunel and the Jacksonville Jacksonville Jaguars at home in that playoff game Mm -hmm. that still haunts you to this day. Correct. And my point is that Rich Paul and LeBron's agency represents Ben Simmons. And it did do my heart a little bit of good that in the meeting that they had a couple days back, Rich Paul did fly to Philadelphia to sit down with Daryl Morey and company. I think there are other executives involved to try to hash it out and break the stalemate. Well, it did my heart good because I thought that Daryl Morey would be forced to fly to L.A. to to have an audience with Rich Paul. And it it worked the other way. Mm -hmm. It's because the Sixers have dug in and I am rooting for them in this situation because they value Ben Simmons because they should. He is a dominating player to me. I I get the the glitches. I get get all the the frailties. I get it that he's never developed any kind of jump shot, three-point shot, mid-range shot, and his free throws come and go. But I always hark back to that one game, February 15th at Utah, last, you know, going back to last year, obviously. 2021, uh, you mean? To, I'm sorry, 20, because well, he's been out now for the whole time. But we're going all the way back to 2020. But February 15th at Utah, he got upset because Gobert was getting all this acclaim for Defensive Player of the Year again. And he said, okay, watch this. And he went for 42, what was it, 9 and 12 assists. That night at Utah, he made 12 of 13 free throws. So you can't tell me he's not capable because we know he's capable. And the Sixers know full well just how capable he is because he won Rookie of the Year. He made three straight All-Star teams. He made two straight the last two years that he played all defensive teams. Huh, that's pretty great. And in that Game 7, he took a little mice tray completely out of the game because Ben at 6'10 is so long and so quick and so agile and, and just so smart, high IQ, that... He just enveloped little Trey Young and held him to 5 of 23, and the Atlanta Hawks still survived that game, maybe because of Ben's lack of on the offensive end. I I got it. But the Sixers are saying, no, we got four more years. We're not going to let you run our organization, Rich Paul. Or I think they're looking at LeBron in the biggest picture. LeBron, you don't run this league. We run the 76ers, and we gave him a deal, and he signed it in good faith because we did. So we're well, going to honor, and he needs to honor. Well, let me tell you what else you did. You ran your mouth, and you know you can't say, I don't care about the heat of the battle. You know there are certain things that you can't say about an athlete or there's no coming back from. And I said that at the time, that there was no coming back from this. Now, the question is, if you want to just hold on to him, and waste four years of Joel Embiid's prime, have at it. But what do you accomplish? Well, we showed him. You st- at the end of the day, Daryl Morey is going to be judged because they brought him there to bring a championship. He and Elton Brand are to deliver the 76ers a championship. Y- Joel Embiid, by himself, 
is not going to get that. I don't, he, he, he's not Wilt. He's not Shaq. And Shaq needed others. He needed a Kobe. So you're not getting a championship with just Joel Embiid and you holding on to Ben Simmons saying, we showed him. He, we showed him. We held on to him for three years. We held on to him for four years and did what? Okay, what? but what, what, what your it's okay, I got you. But they also could make Ben Simmons waste four years of his prime. Does he want to do that? I'm getting because my money. In the end, okay, Shannon, I believe the 76ers are fighting for the league, the image of the league, because I think a lot of fans get turned off by the fact that that a James Harden says, I, I, I want out. I want to go to Brooklyn. Send me to Brooklyn. Okay, yeah. we'll send you to Brooklyn. I think they get turned off by the fact that LeBron says, I, I need Anthony Davis. Go get him. Just go get him. We'll figure it out. Get him. Get, come on. Come on over here. Come to the yeah. Lakers. Well, a, after a while, it's, it's bad for business, and this could be worse for business. Well, teams do it all the time. Teams, they're thinking about trading either Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown. They're thinking about breaking them up. Are the fans going to be upset about that? Oh, they'll get over it, just like they get over when players want to leave. See, as long as teams do what's in the best interest of the team, everybody's cool with that. But the player says, I'm a brand too. I want to win. I don't feel I can win here, so I want to go somewhere I can win. If your obligation as an uh, uh, exec is to do what's in the best interest of the team, the player's uh, best interest of him is also do what's in the best interest of him. If me being here isn't in the best interest of me winning, well, I need to get up out of here. Skip. Go ahead and try to get the best package you can. Skip, nobody's going to give you another comparable superstar because they know Ben Simmons doesn't want to be there. And sooner or later, Skip, you're going to have to get up off it. You're going to have to trade okay, him sooner or later. It, okay, but if you decide to trade Jalen Brown, you, you're going to get value for value. In this case, people are just saying, yeah, we'll give you 25 cents on a dollar. Well, that's what you should have. Hey, hey, you should have kept your mouth shut. Okay. Sometimes yeah. when, when, when emotions are high, logic is low. You say things. Yeah. Stop, stop okay. saying things when you're emotionally upset. Okay, last quick point. Your league, the National Football League, does not allow this kind of player <laughs> movement with contractual years left. You know it and I know it. They nah, just nah, say, nah. Uh -uh. not on our watch. But see, but here's the thing. You know why they don't skip? Because those players don't have guaranteed contracts. In baseball, a guy mm. can hold you hostage because he got guaranteed contracts. In the NBA, when you don't have guaranteed money, see, Ben Simmons got $150, $160 million. He knows that money is coming. Well, that Prescott got the biggest, most guaranteed money coming. That's $75 million. So he can't do anything because after that, now you're at the mercy of the league. That's why the league won't get them players sure. guaranteed money because they're not going to have you running rush out over us. That's the difference between MLB, NBA, and the NFL. No mercy. Well, we watched this, uh, the Cowboys offense. You no, know, they got back on track this past weekend. And now they're ready to make a deep playoff run for the first time this century. And on his weekly radio show, Jerry Jones was asked if it was Super Bowl or bust for Dallas this season. Take a listen. Unquestionably. There's no in-between. You really go into it with the expectation of being in the playoff. To get here, you need to have distinguished yourself, and then once you get here, all bets are off. A lot of that has got to do with availability of your players at that time. We're in good shape. We're in real good shape right now. We should be excited and be planning on it. You know, you don't have but uh, one winner here, and that's the Super Bowl winner. Well, Shannon, do you believe it's Super Bowl or bust for Jerry Jones? Absolutely. And it's going to be bust. Look what I got, Skip Baylor. Yeah. You know, I'll find me a little something. Oh. <laughs> Your day coming to an end on Sunday, Skip Bayless. The 49 is going to end your season, and I love it. Skip, he's absolutely right because Jerry had so much success early on, Skip. Three Super Bowl appearances in his first seven years of ownership. And now he's only had four Super Bowl wins. I mean, four a playoff wins since the last time they won the Super Bowl. So he understands it. Skip, I got $160 million tied up in Dak. I got $100 million tied up in Mari. I got $105 million tied up in D-Law. And you got draft picks in CeeDee Lamb, Trayvon Diggs, Michael Parsons. Skip, yeah, Skip, that's what it is now. You know what the Dallas Cowboys, they brought Dak Prescott back for this very moment. They're like, we can't start over. We're right here. We have a team 
that's built to not only contend, but to compete and win a Super Bowl. That's what it is, Skip. There are several teams that is Super Bowl or bust. I don't believe it's Super Bowl or bust for the New England Patriots. They got a rookie quarterback. Nobody expected anything. The Cincinnati Bengals, I don't believe it's Super Bowl or bust. But I believe for the Green Bay Packers, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Dallas Cowboys, the uh, uh, Kansas City Chiefs, absolutely it's Super Bowl or bust. And especially for the Cowboys because they're the Cowboys. Um, Skip, the uh, the what the Thanksgiving Day game did forty one million. That's you got to go back 30, 40 years to have a, a super uh, uh, Thanksgiving Day game to do that kind of numbers. They do numbers. Five yep. of the ten most watched games this year involve them. So it is Skip. All things being equal, it is Super Bowl or bust. It's not good enough to win this game. It's not good enough to get to the championship game. It's only the Super Bowl matters to the Dallas Cowboys. Okay, back to Jerry Jones. I do (laughs) not believe in any way, shape, or form that he actually believes this is Super Bowl or bust for him. I don't believe, for me, as a diehard, lifelong Cowboy fan, it is Super Bowl or bust because all I have predicted to you was that my Cowboys would win the East and win one playoff game, and they will beat the 49ers, and you will suffer severely for it next Monday on Undisputed. I hope you show up. But that's all I predicted and all I need for this year to be successful. Maybe next year I increase my prediction and my forecast. But now back to Jerry Jones. I have told you from the start that I believe that this team has had to overcome to win in spite of its head coach, number one, and its owner slash operator, Gerald Wayne Jones Jr. (laughs) Again, Jerry talks too much. We talked yesterday. He's even talking about his kicker is in a slump. You can't say it publicly because you're going to doom and damn him because he's going to start overthinking it, right? He's going to start thinking, I'm in a slump? You just said said last segment it was okay for Doc and Joel B to say what they said about of Ben Simmons, but now Jerry Jones can't say his kicker's in a slump? I know, but, but it's not over yet. That The, the Sixer season had ended. It was no more. We got to go on to next year. We, we're just getting started. This is the start. This is the one game we have to win. $75 million worth of quarterback has to play like $75 million. Okay, now back to Jerry. The reason heart of hearts it's not Super Bowl or bust is what you just said. They did 41 million rating on Thanksgiving Day. Jerry's got the tiger by the tail. He's he owns America's team. It is the most valuable franchise in all of sports. Will that be diminished? Will he lose any no. money if they lose no. to the 49ers? Zero. No. It but doesn't but here, matter. They're established. They are yeah. box office. Yeah. They are marketability. What did he say four years ago? He started speaking about his football mortality. He started, he's okay. like, I ain't going to be around. I ain't going to be around this thing too much longer. I would like to see one more of these things. How big a check, do you understand how big a check I would write if you could guarantee yeah, yeah, me yeah. I would win one? So, Skip, hey, let's go ahead. He's like, man, you know what? I sure would like to win this thing. Man, you know what? Jerry might disappear. No. Jerry, you might get your wish. He might get on that yacht and sail the seven seas and say, Skip Bayless, I'm no out of here. <laughs> no way. No way. I would agree with you, Shannon Sharp, if he hadn't already won three of those prominently displayed behind his desk in his office at the Star. So my point is, it's not like end of the world, like my life will not be fulfilled if I don't win this year's Super Bowl. He he won it. Three times he won it. Unfortunately, it was in his first seven years. But- and unfortunately for me, it was, what, 21 years ago. OK, I, I got it. But he gets it because he's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He already got in, right? He, yeah. he, oh, his yeah, bust yeah, yeah, is yeah, alongside yeah. your bust in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Yeah. He is as made a man as you can be made. And yes. he is the kingpin of the NFL. What did you say? Sort of half, you know, seriously, but somewhat facetiously. But you said the other day you were ranking who are the most powerful people in the NFL. Yeah, Jerry, Mr. Kraft, and you said, oh, it's Jerry. You, you, you put Jerry first and then Mr. Kraft and then Roger Goodell. Okay. Yep. 
Yeah. Okay. So Jerry's yeah. the most powerful man in the NFL. He owns the most valuable team in all of sports. Yes. And he's in the playoffs. So there's no shame this year where, Jerry, what's wrong with you? There's no ridicule, the usual, you missed the playoffs, Jerry. Fire yourself. Mm -hmm. No, he did it. He pulled it off. They won the East. He, he's basking in the glory. That ain't saying so much. So he can say, what was his line we just heard? You, you know, we should be planning on it. That's what he's saying because they're they're whole, they're healthy. He is embracing the fact his football team, unlike most of the others in the playoffs, is pretty much a thousand percent healthy. And there you, what more and could there you, you ask for? So now, if so now, thank you, thank you. So it's Super Bowl of us because you're healthy. You got a seventy-five million dollar okay, quarterback. But, but, Okay, but most people who say Super Bowl or bust, they're going to bust if they lose their first playoff game where, where they're going to be deeply depressed, where they're going to oh. feel like ending it all because we, we struck out. You're we not had skilled. it all. And you, you, listen, if Jerry loses this playoff game, two days later he's going to be on his yacht celebrating somewhere, celebrating a great season in which they won the East. Well, uh, hopefully the, when, they, when they lose this playoff game, those fans in Dallas show up to work on Monday and for the rest of the week. I got a sneaky suspicion when they lose this game, but you notice I didn't say if, when they lose this game, I'm not so sure that you're going to be able to show up on, on Monday yourself. Are you oh, sure I, you're going to show up? I, yeah, I, I am sure because I am so sure we are going to win this game, and that's not, all I need. I need Dallas over San Francisco, and I am golden. I am a made man. Thank you very much. No. And maybe you can go away and live on your yacht. <laughs> yeah, I got I got a 14-foot bass boat. No, I don't, I don't have a boat at all, Skip. But anyway, Skip, you're not winning. It's Super Bowl or bust. You know it. You done hyped this up. You see what we did? We, Skip, you got the number one offense. You scored the most points. You had the most yards. Did. Your team, the takeaways, turnover differential, all of that. And you don't think, and you're going to be okay with just winning one playoff game? I don't think so, Skip. One. I, I know what you're trying I mean. to do. Know what you're trying to do, Skip. I know you. I know you, Skip Bayless. You, what you're trying to do, do is that you're trying to under-promise and over-deliver. But I won't let you do no, it. No, I'm not. I will. Yeah, oh, no, yes, you are. Shannon, Shannon, we are not going to beat the GOAT at the GOAT. We're just not going to do it. And that would be You're not going to beat Jimmy G. You're not going to beat Jimmy G at AT&T. How about that? No mercy. Well, Russell Westbrook may have hit a new low last night, scoring only eight points on two of 14 shooting in the Lakers' 125 to 116 loss to the Kings. LeBron actually scored a game high 34 points, and LA did have a 14 point lead earlier in the game, but the defense slipped and frustration took over as the purple and gold fell back to 500 on the season. That's kind of their sweet spot these days. We're now joined by First Things First co host Chris Broussard. Chris, Many people peg the Lakers to win the West before the start of the season. It's almost hard to remember that. So what is wrong with L.A. right now? Well, there's a plethora of things, but I'll hit on two right now. Uh, one, guys, is the defense. And mm. I don't know how in the world they're ranked 17th in the league in defensive efficiency because they look a lot worse than that to me. Thank and when you. they play young athletic teams – they just can't stay in front of them, and they can't stay with them. And that's why even when they win, they beat Atlanta, they beat Portland, they beat Sacramento, they beat Minnesota, the games are still fairly close for the most part, right? Because those teams are young and they can move, and the Lakers have trouble staying with them. And last night, you saw they had 70 points in the paint for Sacramento, and then they hit 11 threes. That means you're getting everything you want. Like, that's an analytics person's dream because all you want is points in the paint or three-pointers, and they were getting whatever they wanted uh, from the Lakers because they just, they're just they too old. Their best defender is Avery Bradley. Uh, he's still good, but he's older. He can't stay with guys like he used to. LeBron can block some shots, can get some steals and strips, as we saw last night, but he's not the every-possession defender he used to be. And then nope. Russ... Malik Monk, they're not guarding. And, and so you got either Austin Reeves or Stanley Johnson in there as your, a defensive player. And then I'm going to hit Westbrook. I really think, guys, Westbrook is lost. Like, I don't think he has any idea how the Lakers want him to play. 
And he, he, that's why he's in the shooting slump. I know he's not a great shooter, but I think this is contributing to why he's missing layups. He's missing shots he normally makes. And he's in one of the worst shooting slumps of his career. And he said as much the other night, a couple days ago, he said, sometimes I'm in the dunker spot. Sometimes I'm cutting. Sometimes I'm screening. Sometimes I have the ball in my hands. He does. I think he's trying, but he doesn't. He's confused. Bottom line is he knows how to play one way and be Thank effective you. that way. And that's the way he's played the last 13 years. But that's not how the Lakers need him to play. It's Thank like Allen Iverson at the end in Detroit, in Memphis. Yeah. If he's not Allen Iverson, what's he doing for you? If, this, if Westbrook yeah. can't be Westbrook, what's he giving you? So it goes back to what we all said. It's just a bad fit. Yeah, they're not a good team. I must – Chris, I ain't skip. I'm gonna simplify it even more than that. They're not a good. They're not a good basketball team, <laughs> right now. And the pieces, you're right. They do not fit. Last night, LeBron was very inefficient, which is very abnormal considering the way he's played the last since he's returned. But he was very inefficient last night. He was jacking up threes that I don't believe he should have jacked up because when he started doing that, here come Russ. Like, well, this is Russ saying, well, everybody else is allowed to miss shot. I should be allowed to miss shot. But, Chris, where I'm going to push back on you, you're talking about Russ is in a slump. Russ is shooting the exact same percentage this year from the floor that he shot the previous 13 years. He's shooting 1% worse this year from the three than he shot in the previous 13 years. So, in actuality, he's doing the exact same thing he's done in the previous 13 years. It's just on a bigger stage, just with greater expectations. So, now, he can't hide behind the triple-double. Uh, uh, Chris, we're no longer seduced by the triple-doubles, are we? Because it doesn't mean anything because once we started to pick it apart, we started getting down and we see how the sausage was made. Was like, this joker been playing terrible getting triple-doubles and we've been letting him skate. <laughs> now you're with the Lakers. There's an expectation. Championships. In Washington, nobody cared. You turned the ball over eight times. Who cared? You turned over in Oklahoma City 11 times. Who cared? But you're playing with the Lakers. They were one of the teams that was favored to contend, if not win the title. And now, all of a sudden, when you're on the stage, if I get to see you dance every night, I can see. Man, that joker really can't dance at all. He had us fooled. We watched it one or two times a year, and we thought he was Michael Jackson. This joker out there got two left feet, and that's what has happened. They're not a good basketball team, and the one big piece that they added, it does not fit. They don't play defense, and this is why when you get a 14-point lead, you start jacking up threes, you don't play defense, guess what happens? That 14-point lead all of a sudden turns into an 11-point deficit. The end. Mm. This joker actually has two left hands, and he's left-handed, <laughs> which means he's got the worst hands in the history of basketball. I don't know what he happened. Does. It's stunning to watch. Chris Broussard, my friend, I told you a couple of weeks back that – the only Laker who keeps catching my eye is the undrafted rookie from the University of Oklahoma, Austin Reeves. And I concluded and tweeted last night, it has come to this for the Lakers. Their second best all-around player, the one I won on the floor, fourth quarter, overtime, whatever, is Austin Reeves because he plays fearlessly, relentlessly hard and he knows how to play. He makes the right play. He makes big shots. I'm not saying he's a godsend. I'm just saying it's come to this for the Lakers right now. Because what came clear to me last night, number one, was as great as LeBron is playing, and I do not throw that word around frivolously, great as he's playing in year 19, it came clear last night that once they built a 14-point lead off his three, and he's kind of strutting back up the court, as he should, he's a hot hand. He can't sustain it anymore. He cannot carry a mediocre basketball team to victory, no. even at Sacramento, because he's going to run out of some gas. And he tried to you know, push back down on the accelerator in the fourth quarter, and he, he didn't play very well. He started missing. What are you doing? He went one of four from three in the fourth, and it just wasn't enough. And he, he, it's hard for LeBron to overcome Russell West Brick without Anthony Davis, because I don't care. I know Shannon's down on him. Maybe you are too, Chris. But 
But AD is still a top 10 player. I know he hasn't played that way, but if they did have him, surely they'd have a better shot at winning as a four-point favorite at Sacramento against a team that had lost five straight and six of seven. That's pathetic. That's hitting bottom. And, And it's a combination of all those things back to your defense, Chris. They were number one in defensive efficiency just last year, led by LeBron James, who was a top 10 defensive player in rating. LeBron's now ranked in defensive efficiency 211. So he's just not playing at that caliber and not lifting them up because, to your point, they're lucky to be 17th in defensive efficiency now. They got one last hope, right? They, they, through this season, it's like, okay, let's try this. Let's try this. Let's try this. I think the last thing might be when AD gets back, Frank Vogel has said he's going to play center, right? And so I think obviously you got AD and LeBron on the floor, and they're going to have to – I'm not saying you bench him, but they're going to have to make some serious decisions like in crunch time. I said it last week or two. They're going to have to get Russ out of there, right? I mean, you do it subtly. Do it – you know, don't make a declaration – but they're going to have to try to get him off the floor late and maybe an Agreed. Austin Reeves or a Stanley Johnson put some of these guys yep. around LeBron and AD. And that's your last try. Sure. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, Chris, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us today. No mercy. The Grizzlies are the hottest team in the NBA after winning their 10th straight on Tuesday night. And some people are starting to think that it could translate into playoff success. A recent article on ESPN wrote that, quote, they are officially a problem, and it's not absurd to think that they could win it all this season. We're going there. Shannon, is it absurd to you that the Grizzlies can win it all? Yeah, I'm not going there, Skip. I think it's a little, a little, I would, I I say like my homeboy here in Atlanta, it's a little ludicrous to think that the Memphis Grizzlies can go all, to go all the way. Uh, Let's just play, (laughs) Skip, let's play this out. That means they would beat the Nuggets in the first round if the, the schedule is like it is right now. They would beat yep. the the, uh, uh, the Nuggets in the first round with Jamal Murray back. Then they would go through the Golden State Warriors in the, in the Western Conference semis. <laughs> then they would yep. blitz the Suns in the Western Conference finals. And then that means they're going to yep. get Brooklyn or <laughs> Milwaukee in the NBA finals. I don't... I think it is a great story. I think they're playing unbelievable. I think... Um, John Murray, John, John Murray, John Morant mm-hmm. is opening the yep. door to superstardom. I love he the is. pieces, the Desmond Baines. I love the Dylan Brooks when he comes back. I love Jared Jackson Jr. Steven Adams is a load. He's going to rebound, going to set great picks. I love what they have. Their bench, they have depth. But I do not see them this year coming out, being the representative for the Western Conference and winning a title, Skip. I think they're a little bit too young, I, but I do think this season – will serve them well down the, uh, uh, in years to come. But I do not see them, Skip, as being a, a, a true title contender, beating Milwaukee or the Nets on the Eastern Conference side. I don't see them getting out of the Western Conference. Shannon Sharp, it yep. would not shock me if the Memphis Grizzlies won it all this year. Man, you every out time I, I test them, every time I watch a game start to finish, I say, man, that... That looks a lot like the best team I see anywhere. That did you looks see better the Nets than the night? Nets. I did. You didn't watch the Nets and, and last night? Okay. I, I watched the whole thing because when KD says, watch this, he does watch this. Okay. Did you see what the Grizzlies did to your Lakers the other night? Man, that is they are we devastating and dominating. Okay, I, I got it. But look, since <laughs> December 1st, they have the best record in basketball. They have the best defensive rating in basketball. They have the third best offensive rating. And then in the big picture, right here, right now, they lead the league in rebound percentage, fast break points, paint points, second chance points, and points per game off turnovers. They are dominating the league. They're terrorizing the league on both ends. As Kirk Goldsberry points out on ESPN, they have become a problem You can just see them growing up right before your very eyes. They're deep and they're smart and they're unified. They move the basketball in ways the Nets never dreamed about moving the basketball. I give you the Nets have three great players. Okay, go ahead. Fox Bet currently has the Grizzly as the 11th best title odds. 
Okay. Level. Good. Well, maybe maybe you should bet a nickel or a dime. Nah, on it. <laughs> if I thought it was serious, I might lay some money down and be willing to uh, reap some of the benefits. But Skip, I just don't see them beating the uh, if the season ended the day beating the Nuggets, the Warriors, the Suns, and beating the Bucks or the Nets. I don't see that happening. I think it's a great story. I think they're playing extremely well. I think this is going to serve them as a building block for years to come. But I think that I don't think they're ready right now. No mercy. Well, on the latest episode of his podcast, Tom Brady admitted that his dropped catch in the Super Bowl 52 loss to the Eagles still haunts him and that he's reminded of the flub by Philadelphia fans constantly. So, Shannon, scale of 1 to 10, how embarrassing was this for Brady? It's a 1 because, hell, I didn't expect him to catch it. It's a lot more difficult <laughs> catching a pass than people realize, Skip. And the thing is, it's like it's just like it's a lot more difficult to throw a pass. There's one thing to just throw a pass when you're out there with your buddies, but when you got someone trying to take your head off and there's a other, another guy that's defending your guy and to fit that ball into a tight window, it's a lot more difficult than what these guys make it look on Sunday. Catching a football, mm. running down the field, catching a ball over your shoulder, controlling your eyes so your eyes don't bounce because you're bouncing up and down because you're running. Tom realize it's a lot more difficult than what he thought. Skip, it's not like somebody throwing the ball and you can just focus like this. He has to catch the ball that's coming over his shoulder. Finally, a little Brady respect and love from <laughs> Shannon Sharp. I am shocked. I give this on a scale of one to ten a zero of embarrassment <laughs> because it was not a well-thrown ball. Brady was, was expecting it over his left shoulder. <laughs> it's supposed to go over his left shoulder, and he threw it over his back shoulder, his right <laughs> shoulder, and he threw it about six inches too far and <laughs> over the wrong shoulder. It was a very Aubrey. difficult catch, and even if he had caught it, he was not going to go much farther. So it did that, not change the game because the Patriots came back to lead that game in the fourth quarter. Right. And plus, Skip, he just needed to extend it even more. And plus, he's worried about getting blasted because, you know, they hit quarterbacks in that situation. (laughs) I'm just picturing him practicing for another moment like that. Skip Shannon, great stuff today on Disputed Back. Same time tomorrow morning. Have a great day.